Some pieces of media are difficult to look at from a non-biased perspective since they just hit too close to home for you. I'm not afraid to admit that this is the case for a lot of the things I talk about, and Studio Ghibli's Whisper of the Heart is just another one of those for me. Whereas Miyazaki's The Wind Rises hits me on a deep level because of its subtext and its connection to its creator, Whisper of the Heart hits me for all those reasons and more. Everything from its main character to its nostalgic atmosphere makes me feel a steep roller coaster of emotions whenever I watch it, with a lot of those feelings coming out at the most unexpected times. With that being said, I obviously do believe that there is something magnificent about Whisper of the Heart and the story behind it outside of my own personal connection with the film. I read a lot of interviews, reviews, analysis, and many other different works centered around the film, preferably from the creators and workers on the film and the studio itself and the story's original manga creator. And I believe I've found more than enough to talk about in a fully detailed review and analysis to explain just why this film succeeds at what it does, why it connects to me and so many others, and most importantly, how it depicts real everyday people. There's a larger addition of realism to this film compared to pretty much any other Ghibli work, which is another reason why it fascinates me so much. I'm going to use articles and excerpts from Kondo, Miyazaki, and some other people to explain certain points, explain and expand upon them, then give my own personal two cents and analysis on the things that struck me the most on a personal level. To begin, I want to emphasize just how much realism takes into effect here. And when I say realism, I don't mean its artwork and animation, which still holds the fantastical Ghibli style but more so the atmosphere and nature of the characters within the story, as it's all more grounded than the traditional Ghibli movie. It's less exaggerated and relies more on its environment than the over-the-top actions of the usual Ghibli film. The world around Shizuku never stops for her since it doesn't revolve around her. That is something you learn to come to terms with as you grow up, and growing up is a central theme of this film. Characters such as all the people in her family always seem to have something new going on, like her sister, who at first is the housekeeper and the one to take care of all the chores, later talks with Shizuku and her mother about her planning to move out, which slightly changes the feel of the scenes when she's at home now that her sister isn't there. This moment doesn't necessarily contribute to the overall plot, but it reminds us that things are moving outside of our main character's POV. The characters around her aren't just plot devices that only appear when it's time for a specific character moment. That creates a world with less depth and removes interest, but these characters are treated like real people with real things going on outside of the plot, like Shizuku's mother who spends a lot of her scenes mentioning her college education. Stuff like this is never the focus of any of the scenes, but they do add to the layers of this film by giving it characters that feel like real people, who are up to something even if we aren't on screen with them. This happens within the school sections of Shizuku's story as well through the developments of Yuko and Sojimura. The reason I bring this up as a big reason for its success is because the plot of the film is very loose. We are not entirely focused on one thing or one goal until we're more than three-fifths of the way into the runtime. The movie wants to depict not just the story of two characters falling in love, but the story of adolescents growing up, building connections, and living their lives. And with that, the world needs to be moving. It can never stop with them. The role of side characters in a story aren't necessarily to only support the protagonist the whole way through, but also to remind us that the world is continuing to remove regardless of whether or not they are. Time isn't stopping for Shizuku. We are constantly reminded of how her stubbornness and determination with her books and writing is affecting her education, and her family and school situation is changing all the time. These are simple things, but they are incredibly easy for writers to forget about when writing characters in their story, because it doesn't directly tie into what the main character is going through. The atmosphere and art of the film and its depiction of everyday life in Tokyo adds to my point here, which I will explain mostly through a quote by director Kondo himself, as he can explain the technical aspects of his film better than I ever could. From the preparation phase, we discuss discuss what kind of art we should have, including with the art director Kuroda and Mr. Miyazaki. Initially, I asked them to depict Tokyo as it is, not omitting things like telephone poles. On top of that, I requested them to draw a townscape that's just a bit cleaner than reality. You know, after it rains, colors become more vibrant and the scenery looks a bit cleaner than usual. I wondered if we could incorporate such a touch. 
thought it would be nice if it gave a slightly nostalgic feel. When depicting Tokyo, the color of the sky leans more towards the hue of the buildings rather than a true blue. This is influenced by smog resulting in a whiter hue. That's the foundation. So instead of the clear blue sky or greenery you'd see in the highlands, we aimed for a feeling that's more in line with present day Tokyo. But as it stands, that would be a bit depressing, so I asked them to make it just a bit prettier. If the perspective or mood changes just a bit and produces a feeling of, oh, it looks like this, I'd consider that a success. When we scouted locations around Saseki, we also took photos. Kuroda used those as references and drew a depiction of the hilltop area. There was a hill beyond the road, and the far-off clouds had a yellow tone. The coloration, reminiscent of sunlight breaking through after the rain, was incredibly appealing. The hint of yellow in the clouds gave it a touch of nostalgia, and the reflecting light produced a dazzling feel, which was very appealing. I believe that became the base style. This adds to what I'm saying as Kondo goes in depth on not wanting to remove the feeling that the real Tokyo emits, while still adding that small sense of whimsy and beauty from Ghibli that you just can't get out of real life. While the mood is certainly reworked, the overall scenery, depth, and complexity of the landscapes of the city are not removed in the process of giving it the animated look, thus keeping it faithful and true to its real-world inspiration. The real world just isn't as vibrant as the worlds we see on our screens. However, those tools and images we create do stem from the world we live in, and so I've always believed that the best way to depict our world in animation is to emphasize that level of depth that you can't imitate while adding that vibrance and beauty which originates from what is around us. If that beauty can be put on paper, then that can only mean it's there in our real lives as well. Miyazaki's involvement in Whisper of the Heart was high. He is the one that discovered the original source material for the story, but there are many reasons why this is Kondo's film and not his, and I think the biggest example of this is in the character of Shizuku herself. I've made a video not too long ago in the past about Ponyo, where I explained how Miyazaki understands how to cater to young audiences better than anyone else, and I still think that's true. However, there are many ways for you to make characters that appeal to young audiences. There isn't one specific way, Miyazaki just has his own style. And Kondo's way of fleshing out a multi-layered child protagonist in Shizuku is much different from Miyazaki's. Miyazaki likes to emphasize the youth of his young characters through over-the-top behaviors and imaginative worlds that younger people would dream to be in. Miyazaki treats that youth as something to be celebrated, almost as if he's telling the kids watching his movies to enjoy those years while they last. And while Whisper of the Heart still has that same overall point, the way Kondo goes about it is much different. Shizuku is the furthest thing from over the top. She can act impulsive, but in most cases she's always got something on her mind, and she overthinks a lot of things, making her more reclusive than others. The entire narrative surrounding her and her story she's writing near the end of the film only has one obstacle, and that's her own mind, which makes her hesitant to show the story to others as she thinks they'll hate it. She's antisocial, anxious, and a bookworm quite the opposite of the average Miyazaki protagonists, who are usually pretty extroverted. Her more urbane personality fits her more than the quirks of a Miyazaki protagonist would in this story, considering her journey that revolves around her overthinking nature, her confusion for the future, and her anxiety that comes with growing up. I'd like to include another article excerpt for, that comes from Ghibli president Suzuki Toshio's own experiences on the film, where he states something that I think perfectly explains the subtle differences that add to the film's consistency, where he states this. Firstly, there's a scene where Shizuku visits the staff room and discovers from a library card that the Seiji Amasawa she had been curious about was her classmate. In Miyazaki's storyboards, a startled Shizuku quickly runs down the stairs with her friends. However, in Kondo's direction, instead of running, she walks down slowly. This clearly highlights the difference between the two directors. In Miyazaki's version, the girl's body reacts before her mind, but Kondo's portrayal is of a child who internalizes her shock and then acts. The second scene is when a dejected Shizuku visits a shop named Earth Shop. Seeing the shop close, she leans against the wall, sits down, and speaks to a cat. In the scene, there's no one around yet Kondo's Shizuku ensures her skirt stays in place to avoid revealing her underwear, while Miyazaki's Shizuku sits without a care, unintentionally showing it. Kondo's Shizuku always seems conscious of how she appears, and this portrayal makes certain scenes feel a bit awkward. It's a stark contrast, and Miyazaki was upset seeing this. If it was as per Miyazaki's storyboards, Shizuku would have been a cheerful girl, but Kondo Shizuku feels sophisticated and contemporary, which undoubtedly adds charm to the film. And Suzuki is right in this case. Shizuku's subtle quirks of self-consciousness make her feel more human. It's the type of characteristics you would expect from a girl of her style in the real world. 
These subtle changes smoothen out the sphere of a character who would otherwise be rough around the edges if she was done the same way Miyazaki had originally intended her to be. That isn't to say anything negative about Miyazaki here, of course not, but it does show that Yoshifumi Kondo was, in fact, the perfect choice to control the overall direction of Whisper of the Heart. I like this a lot myself because I can personally relate to Shizuku's character a lot more with the way she actually is in the film that we got. I'm gonna go into a little bit of personal talk now, so if you don't want to hear that, you can just skip forward, but if you do that, it'll hurt my whittle feelings, so I would recommend staying. But I, like Shizuku, am a bit of a bookworm. I love reading as much as possible even if I should be doing other things instead, like schoolwork. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that too, but it is something there for me. I'm also a pretty self-conscious person and I'm more of a person who reacts more internally than externally. I enjoy writing heavily, and while I don't believe most of my stuff is anything amazing, what I do know is that everything that I write comes from the heart. I never make anything that I don't have a personal connection to, because that just feels artificial and fake. I'm much like Shizuku in that sense that I can be very self-conscious about my own work, but one thing I can admit about it is that it is true to the person that I am, and it is true to the philosophy that I have about life and storytelling. Even if not everybody will love what you do, even if you are rough around the edges, those are all things you can improve on. The one thing that you really need to always look for in your work is your passion, because that's what you need the most to make something that can mean something to somebody else. This is a lesson that she learns from Mr. Nishi, and one that anyone interested in writing must understand too. Nothing's ever perfect at first, but you can always smoothen it out after your first attempt. There's no need to rush, as art and passion is timeless. You shouldn't feel ashamed for your passions and your hobbies, and you shouldn't feel ashamed for inexperience. The more you make, the more you will learn. That is what the stone represents, and it is the art-based message of the story. However, the film has much more to say than just that. This is a film that celebrates the passion of youth. The title, Whisper of the Heart, couldn't make this more clear. I think the scene that best represents this is the scene around the middle of the film where Seiji plays the violin while Shizuku sings her rendition of Country Roads. Despite the atmosphere being very warm and the tone of the scene being very clearly uplifting, I couldn't help but feel the most emotional at this point in the film than in any other scene. There's something about everyone coming together to play and sing along to this little folk song rewritten by a middle schooler with writing aspirations that just warms my heart more than anything I've seen from Ghibli. It might just be because these scenes always get to me. For example, there's a scene in Akira Kurosawa's Scandal where everyone comes together to sing Auld Lang Syne for the new year. Just before before this, the film had been very slow and otherwise depressing, but this short moment here pauses all of that so our characters can enjoy a moment of life together. It's scenes like these that make me appreciate just how the film represents humanity, and how we could be as a community. These scenes are those celebrations of our humanity. While these are very different scenes, they invoke the same type of emotions for me. It became easier for me to understand why I felt these emotions so heavily when I learned the story of the lyrics of the film, or rather, the story of Kondo and Miyazaki differences in how the lyrics should be. I'll return to Suzuki Toshio's article for the story, as it details things very well. This will be a much longer excerpt, so please bear with me here. Miyazaki had decided from the beginning to make Country Road the theme song of this work, emphasizing the importance of its Japanese translation. Initially, he planned to write the translation himself, but he was too busy with the storyboards. Moreover, the scene where Shizuku sings Country Road in the Earth Shop is a pre-score. The lyrics were urgently needed before recording the song, pushed to the limit. Miyazaki came up with an unexpected idea. Got it. Let's have Suzuki's daughter do it. I was stunned. I was thinking, what have I gotten myself into? But with no time left, there was no other option. I went home and asked my daughter, do you want to give it a try given the circumstances? I think she was 19 at the time, at the height of her rebellious phase. How much is the pay? When's the deadline? She responded, sounding just like a pro. I never dreamed I'd have to negotiate a contract with my own daughter, but anyway, she agreed to write it. I felt bad for her, but I also thought, even if it's terrible, showing something completed might motivate Mr. Miyazaki to write it himself. Come the deadline day, my delinquent daughter hadn't returned. She finally came home late at night, and I told her, today is the deadline, do you understand? She replied, I'll start now, and brought out a dictionary. But to my surprise, she wrote the lyrics in about five minutes without even opening it. And Mr. Miyazaki liked those lyrics. He said good, and made a few minor changes to complete them. However, there was an argument between Miyazaki and Kondo about those changes. The original lyrics my daughter wrote were, living alone, leaving the city without anything. Miyazaki changed it to, being all alone, without fear, 
dreaming of living. Originally, John Denver's song was about going back to that nostalgic hometown. My daughter changed it to a narrative about someone who ran away from home and can't return even if they want to. Miyazaki appreciated it, but it was too explicit, so he slightly blurred the element of running away. Mr. Kondo insisted that the original lyrics were better. This sparked in an intense debate, which almost turned into a shouting match. In the end, Kondo gave in, and they settled on Miyazaki's version. I wondered, why did the usually reticent Kondo fight so passionately over those lyrics? It was a mystery to me. The puzzle was solved after the movie was completed. During a national campaign in Sendai, I had a chance to dine with Kondo. He softly said, I still think the original lyrics are better. I ran away to Tokyo to become a manga artist. I truly had nothing. He was in tears. By chance, the lyrics my daughter wrote mirrored the life of Mr. Kondo. He practically ran away to Tokyo determined to become an animator. He wanted to go back home, but couldn't. He probably felt that becoming a director was the only way to truly go back to his hometown with pride. Those lyrics, unexpectedly found in his directorial debut, must have meant a lot to him. That's why he didn't want them changed. Though he was a man of few words who seldom revealed his inner thoughts, he must have had a fiery passion inside. That night's conversation deeply touched my heart. While the original lyrics were not included in the film, I still believe that passion Kondo had for them remained in it, at least as much as they could have been. It really makes you understand the importance of the changed lyrics as well, since I'm sure many people wondered the purpose for them. While it was left more vague, I think the film carried on that personal connection Kondo had with them. But it once again reminds you why Kondo was the right choice for this film. This is a story he was personally connected to on a deeper level than anyone else in Ghibli. And when you read how people described him as a person, you can see that Shizuku herself mirrors Kondo a lot. Even with the inexperience of never having been a director before, no one would have done a better job than him because no one else had the passion and care for the story that he did. His vision for it, while not entirely done on his own, was the right one for the film. And the changes he brought to it make it stand out from the usual Ghibli film, are what makes it such a special story. And that's because it feels more real than any other film in the company, without taking away from the beauty and charm that only Studio Ghibli can create. It's just that with Kondo, another identity of the studio was discovered, that despite being short-lived due to Kondo's untimely death, would forever impact Ghibli's future projects. And looking through the limited interviews Kondo had, I found one quote that stuck with me the most. In that regard, if I could capture what was depicted in the storyboards, I'd be content. I wasn't particularly striving to make it in my style or overthink it. It felt as though I had the freedom to execute it just as I envisioned. However, something that sound director Miss Naoki Asari told me was with Mr. Miyazaki's works, when giving voice voice actor's directions, she often felt unsure whether she truly understood Mr. Miyazaki's intentions. But this time, there was none of that. She said every scene was easy to understand, from the character's emotions to the content. Also, producer Mr. Toshio Suzuki told me that if Mr. Miyazaki had done it, he feels it might have turned into a story where a special child struggles with her unique abilities. But in the version I did, even though the character movements lacked some dynamism, it felt like a regular child trying to write a story. Only after hearing this did I feel like I understood my place, or rather rather, how others saw my work. And that's how many people viewed this film, including myself. It doesn't feel like your typical mythical adventure. A lot of this film is rather uneventful. No major events go down within the context of the story, and a lot of time passes where characters are simply just trying to live life. But that is what makes this film genuine. It is the story of a real child growing up and learning to accept themselves and their feelings. It is about that troublesome in-between section of our youth where we are no longer eccentric and over-the-top impulsive babies that we once were but we're also not old and experienced enough with the world and our own lives to truly understand ourselves where we want to go further down the road. We will have our moments where we need to think like an adult in these times, but there are also times where letting those childish tendencies jump out can lead to good things too. This is most evident in the ending of the film, where Seiji asks Shizuku if they can get married in the future. That line was Miyazaki's idea. He said it would be weak if Seiji simply told Shizuku, I love you. The line is more of a resolution, looking beyond that white haze and deciding to walk forward together. That's why why it works. Also, isn't it said that young people nowadays have a somewhat superficial way of connecting? They don't express their feelings directly? I'm guilty of that too. With that in mind, we decided to use the line, will you marry me, to encourage young people to express their feelings more openly. In quite a few of these interviews, Kondo admits his regret in not expressing himself more in his younger years. The line, will you marry me, works as the resolution not just because it's more specific, but because it represents the connection the two have. I love you is a vague term, but marry me is not. Shizuku 
Dooku and Seiji have created a connection with one another that we never see them recreate with another character. Their bond surpasses the time they spent together and the time they spent without each other. It's more than just romance and platonic. The connection they have is timeless and not one they can reforge with someone else the same way they have with each other. Is it realistic for a kid to ask a girl to marry them? Not necessarily, but it makes the most sense with what we've seen from Seiji and Shizuku, and seeing them express those less self-conscious ways make it all the more satisfying. Whisper of the Heart's cozy and nostalgic atmosphere guides its young characters in the transitioning phase of their youth in a calm yet emotional journey that feels more than real enough to connect with many, including myself, on a personal level. It has one of the studio's most relatable and realistic protagonists that represents more than what she stands as on the surface. From her subtle quirks to her passions and goals, the consistency of Shizuku's character and personality, as well as her internal conflicts with self-doubt and dealing with the harsh reality of the world not slowing down for her, is something that I think many of us have gone through at times, regardless of our age. But while those problems may never truly go away, they are things we can overcome. We just need to calm down and take our time. There is one more quick excerpt I want to include before finishing this video that I think perfectly encapsulates my thoughts on this story and why I hold it so near and dear to me. It comes from a review, like my own, that states in its hook. Books have time folded within them. The cover of a book is a gateway to another time and space painted in the past. When that cover is open, one can enter another world different from reality, to the world of fairy tales of fantasy, a world that makes the heart soar. But soon enough, there comes a moment when it's not just about getting lost in the world of the book. The path inside the book begins to reverse, leading back to the real world. At that moment, the book becomes a gateway not just for another different world, but a gateway to change the reality we know bit by bit. And that inversion typically happens during adolescence. That's why adolescence can be tough, full of doubts and confusion. But during this period, when you encounter something, you can hear the sound of the world changing. Studio Ghibli's Whisper of the Heart is not only about such discoveries and encounters, but it is also filled with the realities of daily life. Living in housing complexes, the mother's studies, the sister's independence, the plastic buckets found even in beautiful homes. I believe it captures the tumultuous yet earnest feelings of adolescence. Supporting this reality was director Yoshifumi Kondo. Unfortunately, two and a half years after making his directorial debut with Whisper of the Heart, he passed away. Reflecting on the significance of this film, one can only deep deeply feel how great and regrettable this loss was for Studio Ghibli. However, music, transcending time and space, will likely reach director Kondo. When you listen closely, it's the sound that connects the real world, the time already lost, and the time to come. And I believe that this is the best way to describe this film and its specialties. From its sound, to the art, to its characters, Whisper of the Heart is put together near perfectly. While Kondo died not long after the film's release, and it's a shame we won't ever get to see the stories he would have wanted to continue telling, Whisper of the Heart is a unique achievement that changed Studio Ghibli forever, to the charm that no other Ghibli film quite matches. That alone puts Kondo in a special spot among his contemporaries, and makes Whisper of the Heart one of the studio's most special works. It is a story I hold dear to my heart, and one that many can say the same for. And it's a story that, with messages while aimed at younger people, is something that many in their later years could still use to guide them, as we are never truly finished actually growing up. Coming of age tales like Whisper of the Heart always intrigue me in how they deliver their stories, which is why I cover these types of movies and anime a lot on my channel. I hope you enjoyed this video, it took a lot more reading than my usual uploads, but I believe it was worth it. Whisper of the Heart is a special story to me, and it's one of my favorite Ghibli movies, and so I hope I was able to do it just despite my amateurish vocabulary and video editing style, as well as some goof-ups with my audio. <laughs> but I adore this film and its protagonist, and it's something I treat as one of my comfort films. But that is going to do it for this video. If you enjoyed it, leave a like to support its growth, and subscribe to the channel to support my growth overall too. I've been busy with college, but I am trying to get back into the swing of things with my videos. I want to start trying to make more well-researched and longer content as well, so it may take more time. I want to grow as a writer and as a creator, so I I believe that's what's best, and you guys deserve to see the best content that I can possibly make. So once again, support me while you're here, subscribe, leave a like, comment on your favorite Studio Ghibli movie and character, and maybe even become a channel member while you're at it. You get custom emojis and early access to videos, and it's only $3, but if that doesn't interest you, that's fine by me as well. I've rambled long enough, so I'll be leaving you on your own. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Y'all have a good day.